Well, good evening, everybody. Um, my name's Professor Joe Rycroft Malone, and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Health and Medicine, and I'm I'm hosting this uh, lecture, this public lecture this evening. So a very, very warm welcome to you all. Um, so this is our seventh lecture in this year's series. So a, a very warm welcome to this particular lecture where we're exploring some, um, some of the challenges that, that people who have living with Parkinson's have had, some of the challenges that some of our care homes and nursing homes have had during this pandemic period. These lectures are really important to us um, as a way of engaging with you, uh, with our community more broadly, um, in meaningful and, and relevant issues. And, and I'm sure you're going to find um, the, the presentations that we have this evening um, of interest. Um, and, um, a, 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 and generally um, really enlightening, I think. Um, so we are joined. I'm very delighted um, to welcome Professor Joe Knight, who's a professor of applied data science. And uh, Joe is also the research director for the Eden North project. And also um, Professor Jane Simpson. Um, Jane is a professor of psychology of neurogenitive conditions. Um, Dr. Fiona Eccles isn't with us this evening, but she has kindly recorded her talk. So um, that's great that we'll actually be starting off this, this evening's lecture with, with her talk. So I do hope that you have a really enjoyable evening. Um, we're first going to listen to Dr. Fiona Eccles. And, and as I say, she's pre-prepared a recording for us. So we're going to, to look at that first. Hello. My name's Fiona Eccles, and along with my colleague, Jane Simpson, I'm going to talk to you about some work that we've been doing, looking at the impact of lockdown on well-being for people with Parkinson's. And in particular, I'm going to focus on a piece of work that we did jointly with the charity Parkinson's UK. We had several collaborators uh, work with us on this project who I want to acknowledge. Um, the list is there for the folks who were involved from Lancaster University and also from Parkinson's UK and from the Parkinson's UK end the project was led by Cathal Doyle. The work led to a report um, and the link at the bottom of the slide um, shows where you can access the full report that I'm going to talk about uh, from the Parkinson's UK website. So first of all, to introduce what is Parkinson's? It's a progressive neurological condition and it causes most commonly symptoms such as a tremor, slowness of movement and also stiffness. However, alongside those physical symptoms are many other um, non-movement related symptoms. So things such as pain, People can have uh, lots of fatigue, sleep problems, problems with their bowel and bladder, um, excessive sweating, for instance, problems with swallowing, problems with saliva production, as well as uh, many psychological difficulties uh, such as anxiety and depression, apathy, so finding it difficult to find motivation, as well as di difficulties with thinking and memory. And also some people can experience hallucinations or delusions, i.e. believing uh, things that aren't true. Um, and sometimes uh, these occur as a reaction to the medication that people are taking. Normally, Parkinson starts um, over the age of 50. Uh, it increases with age, more common as you get older, but younger onset is also possible. And it is relatively common. There are about 145,000 people in the UK who have Parkinson's, and it's the second most common neurodegenerative condition after Alzheimer's. So today I'm going to focus on some work that we did with Parkinson's UK. And this was looking at the results of a survey Parkinson's UK surveyed their members in April and May of last year, so uh, just about a year ago, during our first lockdown. 
because of the lockdown, the survey was only available online um, because we had no access to uh, printing or to the postal services. And um, it was mainly a tick box uh, quantitative survey, so with, with boxes for people to select, but there were also some free text boxes for people to write in their experiences. And the data were analysed together by Parkinson's UK and by us at Lancaster. So who took part? Um, it was very kindly completed um, by 1,491 people with Parkinson's and 275 carers also completed it, but on behalf of someone with Parkinson's when the person with Parkinson's perhaps was unable to complete it themselves. Um, we had a, a wide age range of participants from 32 to 90 um, and the average was 67 years, which is probably a, a bit young for a typical Parkinson sample and no doubt reflects the fact that we collected data only online. 45% um, were female, the vast majority of participants were white and 80% lived with their partner um, and 16% alone and also most of the sample, 78% were retired. So one of the questions that the survey asked was whether people had experienced any change in their Parkinson's symptoms during lockdown. And we found that over a third of participants had experienced increased slowness of movement and increased stiffness and increased fatigue. Over a quarter of those re respondents had experienced worsening tremor, anxiety and sleep problems. And people also reported uh, increases in lots of other symptoms, pain, other movement problems, memory problems, um, also in depression, hallucinations and delusions and in eating and drinking problems are those they were they were less often reported um, than the difficulties reported above. And these were largely people who didn't feel that they'd had COVID. So this was not responding to having had the condition, but largely was a result um, of living in a lockdown situation and uh, the difficulties that that led to. And you can see he, here people describing some of the symptoms and the impact in their own words. So the first person uh, is a younger person with three uh, young children and is still trying to uh, manage the, all the household tasks um, alongside the difficulties caused by Parkinson's. And they comment that the stress has definitely made their Parkinson's much worse. And the second quote from somebody with more advanced Parkinson's who's finding they're having significant problems with their physical functioning and they're finding it increasingly difficult to do anything and as a result become very anxious and frightened. Respondents also told us about the impact of the lockdown on their healthcare appointments. So over a third had had appointments with their Parkinson's nurse cancelled and over half were not offered an alternative phone or online appointment. Parkinson's nurses are hugely important for people with Parkinson's. They're the person that they will see most often and who will help them with the day to day management of their Parkinson's. And a third had similarly also had appointments with their Parkinson's consultant cancelled. And over two thirds of those were not offered a phone or online appointment. And people with Parkinson's can wait a long time to be able to see a consultant due to long waiting lists. Uh, and so this would be very difficult to have those appointments pushed back yet again. Also, uh, many other sorts of therapy appointments were cancelled. Appointments with occupational therapy, uh, psychology or speech and language therapy. And in particular, 70% had had their physiotherapy cancelled, which, as I said, uh, inputs such as physiotherapy and doing daily exercise can be very important for people with Parkinson's. In addition, 
nearly half of the people who were previously receiving social care were now receiving less care during, during lockdown. And perhaps when we come to look at the data about the impact on the carers later on, uh, we can see who perhaps had had to pick up uh, some of that care themselves. And here someone describes how they feel having their appointments taken away, that they feel abandoned really by the NHS, that their appointments with the neurologist, the nurse and the uh, physio have all been taken away from them with no alternatives offered. And you read la la lower down that they're also struggling um, with not being able to do their usual programme of activities to keep themselves well. We asked people with Parkinson's about the impact of lockdown on their everyday life. Nearly half were saying they were not going out at all, or perhaps only to exercise if they lived somewhere where they could go out and not meet anybody else. The main problems were not being able to access exercise or other forms of physical activity, which were essential for maintaining their physical well-being. And also there were difficulties getting food or other essential items in a way that felt safe. Getting prescriptions from the pharmacy was difficult for some people. And everybody reported the reduced socialising with family and friends had had a huge impact and uh, including increased loneliness. And also there were difficulties, particularly in the first lockdown, about the lack of clear guidance as to how much at risk people with Parkinson's were and uh, what sort of supports they should be entitled to. The first person here describes how difficult it is having had their regular exercise taken away from them. Not only the impact on their physical health, but they explain how this actually has an effect on their mental state too um, and causes a, a reduction in, in their well-being. And the second person describes how difficult it is to get shopping. Um, here's a, a couple who, due to their physical limitations, were already shopping online, but now because there were no free supermarket slots, they're suddenly unable to get their shopping at all. As I think for many of us during the pandemic, that it initially felt like a bereavement that suddenly all the activities and connections that we are used to having uh, had disappeared. And this person is able to have Zoom calls, but comments that this is nothing like face-to-face -face contact. However, there were one or two more positive stories. So I've included one here just to give a flavor that uh, sometimes people were able to make connections on uh, via Zoom or other video software um, in order to make connections and continue at least some of their social life, although this tended to be, uh, I should say, more of the exception rather than the norm. So in summary, for people with Parkinson's, there were increased symptoms and increased distress, reduced access to health care, reduced access to exercise and other physical activities, and also for some food and medication, as well as a loss of social contact and support and for those who were previously receiving social care, a reduction in input. As well as surveying people with Parkinson's, we also asked carers, family, friends to complete the survey to tell us about their own experiences and the impact on them. So we had 540 people complete the survey who were carers of family members and friends. Nearly three quarters of those were the partner of the person with Parkinson's. We also had about 21% who were family members, such as uh, children, for instance, and 3% who were close friends. And about three quarters of the people responding lived with the person with Parkinson's. The carers were 65% retired but 20% were still working during the lockdown and 5% were furloughed and a further 6% said they were homemakers. 
and 47 percent so nearly half said that the person with parkinson's depends on them totally so for everything uh, that the person needs that the carer there all the time and 40 percent said that the person with parkinson's uh, depends on them to some extent so the carers families and friends responding to the survey told us that over two-thirds of them had taken on more caring responsibilities, which no doubt goes alongside the information that there was less care being provided by social care, but also less care being provided by other neighbours and friends. 42% of the carers reported that they had worsened mental health and over half when they were in the position where the person with Parkinson's completely depended on them. And 34%, so about a third, had said that their physical health had been affected. And again, that was nearly half at 49% when the carer was in the position where the person with Parkinson's completely depended on them. So a huge impact of physical health and mental health for uh, carers and family and friends. And over two thirds said that they had less time away from the person with Parkinson's to focus on their own needs uh, and to look after their own well-being. Here are some quotes from carers reporting the impact on them. So the first person in particular highlights that they feel more of a prisoner than ever now in their own home. Obviously, Parkinson's means that life is restricted uh, for the carer already and now as they said it's come to a complete halt and the second carer mentions that because they're at home all the time and that the person with Parkinson had become more dependent particularly because there was nobody else around to help that was impacting on the carer's mental health the carers too had lost their support networks as the third quote evidences here and the fourth quote in particular, giving a heartfelt cry for help, that caring is hard at the best of times, but doing it with no respite and no professional support has almost broken me and our marriage. We also gave a standard questionnaire to measure people's well-being called the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale. And the orange line that you can see shows what the average is in the general population when this uh, questionnaire is usually given out. And you can see that people with Parkinson's on average had uh, lower well-being than the average, but that the carers had even lower uh, well-being than the people with Parkinson's, showing that the lockdown was affecting the mental well-being of both the people with Parkinson's and carers. Um, but in particular, carers were having very low levels of well-being. Alongside all the difficulties reported, I thought it was also important to mention that some people had had positive experiences. So here is an example of somebody who'd had input from the health coach, the council and telephone consultations with the neurologist and they're expecting one with the Parkinson's nurse. And they also had input from a carer. So sometimes for some people in some parts of the country, the services did uh, manage to link up and did manage to check on people and help them to maintain their well-being. But I have to say, I think this was more the exception than the rule. The survey that I've presented was obviously completed over about a year ago. And so one might ask, how are people now? And indeed, we are about to repeat the survey um, alongside with Parkinson's UK to find out how people are doing now and um, how appointments are, are working, particularly online or on, on the phone. Um, but I have got here some data that's been collected by the Neuro Life Now app. So that's not just for people with Parkinson's, but is an app for people with all neurological conditions to report um, on their well-being and also to report on their interaction with health healthcare professionals. And we can see from the data collected by the app in March that um, 
people's well-being, people were still struggling with their well-being. 31% were still feeling their mental health needs were not being met and 57% still felt anxious and hopeless. And it looked like people were generally having a mixture of consultations by phone and in person and sometimes by video conference too. So what now for services going forward and indeed for people with Parkinson's going forward? This report by the National Neurosciences Advisory Group has just been published and this group uh, are made up of professionals and patient organisations and commissioning uh, people who are involved in commissioning and it exists to improve the care of people with Parkinson's. The report has highlighted that neurology services were already stretched pre-pandemic and therefore waiting lists have increased during the pandemic period while staff have been seconded to other roles. And that online access to services has been helpful for some but it's not always appropriate for certain conditions or for certain types of appointments. And there are also concerns about the use of digital ways of accessing health, in particular things like video calls, that those who don't have access to the technology and don't have the skills or perhaps have more limited cognitive abilities, in other words, the people that are most vulnerable may not be able to access care via these methods and therefore they are being even more excluded. So that really needs to be thought about quite carefully. And it concludes that neuroscience services need to be properly resourced going forward if people with Parkinson's and other conditions are going to receive good quality care. And on that note, I'll now hand over to Professor Jane Simpson, who is going to tell you a bit more about some of our other work with people with Parkinson's. OK. So, um, yeah, thanks to Fiona for that really comprehensive account of our um, survey data. I'm going to talk to you about something which is slightly different. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about um, an in-depth longitude analysis that we did of um, the same people with Parkinson's experiences during the COVID pandemic. So this was a, a complementary study and it was a, um, a qualitative study. So what that means is that we looked at um, what people told us um, and we analysed their text as opposed to a quantitative survey where you would analyse um, the, the, the numbers coming out of um, a survey, for example. So these were quite in-depth interviews. Um, we interviewed uh, 10 people. Um, each interview lasted between about an hour and 90 minutes and um, the participants were recruited from Parkinson's UK, uh, six men and four women, and they were from uh, the Northwest. So we interviewed them, um, obviously not face to face, but we had real time conversations um, in May 2020, August 2020, and quite recently again this month. And uh, the, the mean age of our participants uh, was around 64 years of age and people have been living with the disease for an average of around eight years. Now, it's quite important to note that this particular group of people with Parkinson's were actually felt that they were doing not too bad at all. Um, that isn't to say that they weren't having challenges and things weren't difficult, but they felt that essentially we were kind of managing OK. Uh, there was one person who had decided to go for 24 hour living care um, at the start of the pandemic, but otherwise people were retaining their previous levels of support, usually living at home with, with a, a partner. Um, so generally participants were relatively independent and no um, significant types of psychological distress at the, type, at the times of the interviews. Um, so what we did, so when we had the interview data, uh, we wrote it up and then we decided to analyse it. Now, just as in quantitative data, where there's lots of different ways of analysing uh, your, your numbers, there are lots of different ways of analysing text. And one of the ways that we looked at this data was using thematic analysis. Now, thematic analysis does what it says on the tin. 
it allows you to extract themes or common groups of meaning about what participants have told you. The other thing that we did was that we wanted to use a specific theory or approach to help us understand the data. And the theoretical perspective that we used was called illness uncertainty. Now, <clears throat> uncertainty or tolerance of uncertainty is a, quite a, a significant concept in psychology generally. And it's basically about how much uncertainty we can tolerate in our lives. So it's about what we do when we can't control things. Now, when we're faced with a situation that we can't particularly control, our first reaction is usually to try and control it. So if I'm sitting at home and I'm wondering whether I've brought the keys in from the car after going supermarket shopping, I can go and check and that can just end the tolerance of that particular level of uncertainty. But there's lots of uncertainty in our lives that we can't control like that. If I'm worried about the pandemic or I'm worried about the, my job or I'm worried about my daughter, then that's the kind of uncertainty that you can't just go out and resolve. And we all have different levels of how much uncertainty we can tolerate in our lives. Now, a related feel to this, how we experience and tolerate uncertainty is when we're ill. So this is whole idea about uncertainty in the context of having an illness. Now, for some illnesses, there might be manageable levels of uncertainty. So, for example, if we've got a cold, we know that it's probably been caused by a virus that we probably going to get rid of it quite quickly. It's going to be a little bit uncomfortable, but we'll probably be okay. So we can tolerate that kind of uncertainty quite well. But there are other illnesses where it's much more difficult to tolerate uncertainty. And certainly for people with Parkinson's disease, there's a lots of uncertainty that they already have to tolerate. So for example, not knowing a cause, which is usual in people with Parkinson's, not knowing how the condition is going to progress, not knowing what symptoms people are going to experience, all these things cause massive uncertainty. And people will vary very much in how they can manage that and the best ways to manage it. So understanding how people cope with the lack of control in these kinds of very complex conditions is, is a real interest for us because it will help us then uh, give advice to people about how they can best manage uncertainty and keep psychologically well. So while uncertainty um, can be associated with positive outcomes, um, it is more usual for high levels of uncertainty to be um, experienced negatively. Uh, before I go on to the negative, I will just say a little bit about how it can be experienced positively. So uncertainty can be associated with um, positive outcomes. So for example, if I, so, I'll give you an example of like people with Huntington's disease, for example, might not want to do the test to find out if they've actually got the condition. If they're at risk of it, they might not actually want to do the condition and find out whether they themselves have got it, if it's in the family. And the reason for that is that although the lack of knowledge adds to uncertainty, it confers psychological benefits as well because people can think that perhaps they don't have it. They can retain hope. And so while there are benefits like that, as I've said, there are also some negatives as well. So more often, illness uncertainty is associated with increased anxiety. You can imagine that the more uncertain you feel about things, then the, the, your levels of anxiety might be really high. It can also be associated with depression, anger, less hope, higher illness intrusiveness. That's the idea that they illness actually really impinges on your on your on your life in a in an unmanageable way and almost overtakes your own sense of identity and it sometimes means that you have fewer practical um, coping responses as well now previous research has shown that there's high levels of illness uncertainty in people with parkinson's and that essentially often this has been experienced quite negatively so coming back to the actual study what we did was, as I say, we, look at, we looked at the interview transcripts, we analysed them using thematic analysis, and we came up with four themes. So these themes are related to this generic concept, which is called illness uncertainty. So the first theme we, we entitled, when this came into being, it sort of like made it more of a challenge. And essentially, this theme was around how um, COVID had highlighted 
or amplified existing fears and difficulties re relating to the uncertainty of Parkinson's. So people were very worried about hospitalisation. If I go into hospital, how will people know that I've got Parkinson's and I need my medications regularly and I, I won't be able to move if I don't have my medication and that's going to make it very difficult, therefore, for certain medical procedures to take place. And people were very wor worried in terms of the, the threat of uncertainty on their independence. Um, how am I going to be able to get to the shops if I've got to shield? How am I going to be able to um, see my doctor if that's not going to be possible? Identity and choice were really important as well. So, for example, some people said, I'm worried that with COVID, people will see me just as a person with Parkinson's and not as, a, and not, and not as the totality you know, of, of the person that the whole person that I am. So we, we had reports of people who were, say, for example, wanting to work, but were told that because they had Parkinson's, it might be best if they agreed to be furloughed. And so this idea of being um, uh, decisions being made about you, not in terms of who you are, but on the on the on the basis of your on your diagnostic label, where previously this had not been an issue was really concerning to people and I think the loss of function was a massive source of um, worries and, and, and anxieties around uncertainty so people worried that lack of exercise lack of ex lack of um, engagement with healthcare was going to be really difficult for them to bounce back from so the second theme that we extracted from the data um, was around what people were doing to cope with that level of anxiety and cope with the uncertainty that they were feeling. So we found that all participants which tried to gain control of the uncertainty of the situation. So all participants were engaged in activities which they felt would help them gain control. Some were more successful than others. So some were psychological um, strategies around acceptance and about um, trying to not judge themselves if they weren't able to go out for exercise. And others were practical things like taking up vaccines, following the rules, et cetera. Um, all participants accepted that the uncertainty that they were experienced was additional to the uncertainty normally experienced as part of having Parkinson's, and that each of the two sources of anxiety, Parkinson's and COVID-related anxiety, amplified each other. The work benefits that people were able to acknowledge um, as a way of dealing with some of the lockdown restrictions. So for some people, they said, for example, it's been a relief to let go of some responsibilities. I'm lucky to live in a retirement village with lovely grounds so I can walk around. People felt a sense of community. People felt that they were in it together. Um, for some of the activities, especially the, the, the clap for carers um, times, um, and that people learned things as well. They learned how to be te technologically um, able and able to do things that they previously didn't think that they were able to do. So they were able to talk about benefits. And this, again, is, a, is, is quite common in the psychology of managing uncertainty. So you, you, you tend to find, you, you can tend to find positives from finding yourself in a situation where the outcomes are not easily controllable. The fourth and final theme was about thinking what people were going to do in the future. So, for example, people had fears about contracting COVID, about the long term effects on their lack of exercise, cancelled health, health appointments being stereotyped in the ways that I've talked about before, and, and about specific effects of lockdown and distancing as well. So, for example, the queuing. You're, if you've got um, a severe tremor or if you've got tremor, it can be very difficult uh, to, to stand in a queue for any period of time. So these were the four themes that we extracted from the data. In terms of general conclusions, we concluded that for people in the study, COVID and Parkinson's was described as a double whammy. However, it's really important, I think, to stress that even in early interviews, the coping strategies for managing illness uncertainty that people had adopted or had adapted, had been prime, had had been honed, and were primed to cope with the additional COVID nineteen challenges. So people with Parkinson's have got very complicated routines. They were able to manage a really 
quite difficult healthcare scenario and a lot of this planning and ability was reflected in the um, strategies that they brought to managing the uh, restrictions from uh, the lockdowns. So we were hypothesizing that perhaps this is a reflection of the practical skills and responses needed to manage such a complex con chronic condition, which all the participants reported having to um, develop. Uncertainty from having a complex condition like Parkinson's had already become embedded in their lives. They'd had to deal, they have to deal with it on a daily basis. And so the argument is that this therefore gave them some skills to cope with um, the additional level of uncertainty. Finally, on this whistle-top story of this study, um, why is this study useful? What, what, have we, what have we gained from this? So I think what we've gained is by understanding individuals' reactions over time and importantly, what has helped certain people to, to cope as best as they can, we can now do certain things. So we are liaising uh, with Parkinson's UK about messaging, about support that can be useful. We're liaising with healthcare professionals about how to present psychologically informed well to work to cope with the illness uncertainty uh, with, an, with an emphasis on opportunity and hope. That isn't to say that we are downplaying the negatives and the difficulties, but we are saying there are certain things which people have found helpful in their own lives in helping them manage. And one of them is a focus on some of the positives that might emerge. Um, we're also liaising uh, with healthcare people about the uh, negative effects of wholly online healthcare. And we're also able to give advice on individual psychological interventions, such as mindfulness, which have got demonstrated effects in terms of illness uncertainty. So I'm going to stop there. Apologies, it was so um, quick, but there's lots to fit in today. Thanks, Jane. Thank you. Um, and I'm in the meantime delighted Professor Joe Knight, Professor of Data Science from the Faculty of Health and Medicine is going to talk to us about all things COVID related from a care home perspective. All right, so um, I'm going to talk about a project that was designed to better inform how we should handle pandemics um, in the context of care homes. For the optimists who think the pandemic is behind us, and, and a lot of us hope it is, I will demonstrate what else we can learn from this work. Um, we're part way through the project. We don't have all of the answers yet, um, but I'm hoping this will demonstrate how the work that we were doing can undertake, uh, we're undertaking can change healthcare outcomes for some of the most frail members of our society. So why care homes? Well, most people are aware that COVID-19 um, pandemic had a major impact on care homes. Deaths over the first wave of the pandemic rose significantly compared to the same previous last year, uh, same period in the previous year. This graph is produced by the Nuffield Trust and it uses data from the Office of National Statistics. It shows care home deaths registered over time. The dark dashed line is the average by month of the reported deaths from 2015 to 2019. So it's a kind of baseline. The purple line shows the reported numbers from early 2020, the, so the, the beginning of when things were really kicking off, through to until February this year. The yellow and green lines are subset of the purple lines and represent COVID and non-COVID deaths. But the take home message from this is the astonishing rise of deaths registered from care homes in the first wave of the pandemic. So we asked the question, did the government know what to do? Well, whatever you think about the, how the government handled things during this pandemic, I don't think anyone would try and say it would have been easy. As we were being locked down um, and the hospitals started to fill up, the government developed a discharge plan. On the 19th of March, 2020, the hospital discharge services requirements was published. The first quote on the slide demonstrates the intention of the plan, underlining that Implementing these service requirements is expected to free up at least 15,000 beds by the 27th of March 2020, with discharge flows maintained after that. So this was really important because we needed to get people into hospital. Lots of the details were around ensuring communication between appropriate sectors and providing um, that uh, funding was in place to allow for these discharges. However, part of the plan was to move some of the people into care homes, as detailed in the second quote. For patients whose needs are too great to return to their own home, about 5% of patients admitted to hospital, a suitable rehabilitation bed or care home will be arranged. And it goes on to say, 
During the COVID-19 pandemic, patients will not be able to wait in hospital until their first choice of care home has a vacancy. This will mean a short spell in an alternative care home and the care, care coordinators will follow up to ensure patients are able to move as soon as possible to their long-term care home. So nobody at this point was starting to think about the transmissions that would follow from this decision. So what are we doing? Well, we set out to try and understand the implication of care practices to try and provide guidance about what approaches would lead to the best health outcomes. And our project has got two prongs. Um, we asked the care home what they thought, and we looked at numeric data. So I'm a data geek at heart, um, and so I lead the data work. And Alex Garner, uh, who is shown here, um, he is my trusty sidekick, also more formally known as my senior research associate. The interview work was led by Prof Nancy Preston, who's the other picture there. We do have a whole extended team as this project involves five universities, two NH NHS trusts and a company. But as I've only got 15 minutes, I'm not introducing everybody today. So who did we talk to in the talky part of the work? Well, we wanted a range of people to tell us how they experienced the pandemic um, and how they made the decisions. So you can see from this side, we have quite the collection. We have people who provide what kind of who decide what kind of healthcare is provided. So commissioners, and we have a range of nursing staff from um, district nurses through to assistants. We also have care home um, and project managers, and importantly, we have care home residents. We're still trying to work on collecting um, this, uh, the uh, discussions with some care home resident family members as well. Um, and it's not only important to make sure that we're representing a, a range of people, but also a range of care homes. So these were all from one part of the country, um, County Durham and Darlington, um, but they were from both independent and chain care homes. They were from care homes that were just residential, as well as, as, well as care homes that were residential and nursing. They had um, between 20 and 75 beds. Um, and the one thing that was constant is that the, these were all rated good by the Care Quality Commission. So probably that was not something that we needed a range of, but there's a range of different things with these care homes. So what did they say? Well, the conversations brought out a lot of points, some of them already familiar from the press. Naturally, there were conversations about the emotional impact on the staff as well as on the residents and their families. People also talked about infection control being normalised, and this might be a positive, but maybe not. We can imagine that this will be um, positive in the, even outside of a pandemic. Increased infection control will be more likely to prevent things like norovirus spreading at speed through a care home, which is obviously a problem for frail individuals, uh, something like norovirus. But also it might mean increased wearing of masks for a long period of time, and it strikes you to wonder how a dementia patient might cope uh, with being in an environment where lots of people are wearing masks. Um, and there was a lesson for the care homes that was similar to so many other sectors. We need to join the dots. Um, despite the systems that are already in place, it's already a challenge to move people from hospitals to care homes because they have different bodies to answer to. They have different standards to uphold and procedures to adhere to. But the people who are being moved are the same people. So we need to make sure that things are joined up and this is done better. And finally, there was a clear impact of the constantly changing policy. Many sectors, the university included, were looking for guidance on how to do their work during a pandemic. But with guidance, we wanted it communicated effectively and where possible in advance. And our conversations with care homes suggested they didn't feel that kind of guidance was, um, they, they were getting that kind of guidance, meeting that criteria. So what about the data work, which is uh, the, the, the work that I've been leading? Now, I'm gonna hope to tell you that data can tell stories too. So I want to introduce you to this large data set and talk about the kind of questions we can answer with it. So we have data from early 2018 through to, um, through to early 2021. So well before um, the pandemic started, we have details of more than half a million healthcare interactions for more than three and a half thousand people. So it's a really unique data set because it contains person-centered data, both from the care homes and from the hospitals. It's really hard to access hospital data for research. It's even harder to access that when it's connected to care home data, because as I've said, they're different parts of the community. So the pie chart gives us information about the source of the data. You can, different colors represent different types of interaction. And you can see that most of these interactions are in the community. 
perhaps a visit from a district nurse. But we also have some from accident, uh, accident emergency, as well as inpatients, say a hip replacement, and outpatients, say a fracture clinic. But the pie chart doesn't tell much of a story. It isn't telling us very much we couldn't see by, um, by eyeballing the data. So we have to do something else with it. Imagine for each person in the data set, I have a length of string long enough to fit a bead for every day in the time period. And I thread the beads using a color code to indicate the type of healthcare interactions. So um, this is a tiny section of the data representing three people over about 10 days. And you have to imagine the beads are oblongs. In this images, gray represents a care home interaction, blue time spent in inpatients, red a visit to A&E, and what we can see, the first person, they're in a care home, then they go to A&E, and then they're admitted as an inpatient. The second um, is an inpatient. They come home for a day, but then go back in as an inpatient. And the third is in a care home with a lot of community support, but they end up as well with a spell in A&E and followed by an admission to inpatients. So if I lay all of these threads on top of each other, I get an image like this. I suspect some of you are beginning to think you would have preferred to look at the pie chart. However, this data is lots of individual uh, journeys through healthcare, and there are some things that we can learn very quickly by looking at it, although perhaps you might need a bigger screen, screen than the one you're looking at at the moment. One thing that you might be able to see, we've got dates along the bottom and all these individuals by NHS number along the side. One thing you might be able to see is that there's a drop in inpatient stays after the first wave of the pandemic. This isn't a surprise. We know that lots of routine things like maybe hip surgeries um, were being postponed. But to really tell stories about these people, we need to classify them according to their interactions over a certain time period and see if we can align these with characteristics. So there are various approaches you can take to thinking about how similar or different things are. For example, when I classify cars, I do it by colour, which causes some amusement among my friends. Other people use manufacturers. In the same way, there are a number of statistical approaches to identify these different threads and to group similar patterns. Many of you will be pleased to know that I don't have time to walk you through all of the statistical approaches here. Um, however, what I can do is talk you through some of the data. So in this figure, we've clustered people over a very specific 30 day period. The amount of kind of pixelation that you can see in the three images um, represents how many people there are in each group, uh, where you've got big pixels, there's less people in the group. Again, gray represents some kind of care home interaction. Blue is time spent in A&E. Uh, red, sorry, blue is inpatient, red is A&E, and green is an outpatient appointment. Suddenly, we can see for this subset of data, the methods we've used cluster one fairly large sample of individuals who spend all of their time, or most of their time rather, in a care home, a second slightly smaller cluster who spend most of their time as inpatient, and then a final much smaller cluster who are in the care home most of the time, but do have daily community checkups. And we're at a stage where we have lots of these different clusters. So what do we do next? We can explore the characteristics of the clusters based on a range of different things. And this is what we're the stage we're up to now. Like I said, I don't have answers, but I can tell you the kind of things we're doing. So we can explore what happened at specific moments during the pandemic. For example, in the month after the publication of the discharge service requirement, what sort of health care um, interactions did we see? We would expect large groups of people to be transitioning from outpatients into care homes. Was this the case though? If we looked at the same month and, um, on a previous year, what did the data look like? There's an assumption that lots of people went into care homes and that led to the high rates of, of death, but our data can show us how much that's really true by looking at the different patterns and comparing them to previous years. What about the other characteristics of peoples in these clusters? So if we see clusters of these people who had the long inpatient spells, do they have a higher level of dementia than patients who cluster um, who are in the care homes? Is it because some of these people had really challenging behaviours, perhaps relating to an inability to social distance, and these dementia patients had to be left in hospital because there were no appropriate care home places for them? So we can also identify clusters of people based on outcome. Do the clusters of people who have a positive test align with those who have a negative test, a COVID test? 
are the cluster sizes similar? Do, so do more people with long hospital stays end up with a, COVID, a positive COVID test? So we can begin to break down all of these data and these clusters and ask about the characteristics and ask what was really happening with healthcare interactions? What were the outcomes? What was going on? So I'm hoping from that you can begin to see that data can tell you stories as well as people. So I promise to try and convince the optimists um, that there's still something useful in this wonderful world where the COVID rates do seem to be hitting rock bottom. And there are a number of other questions we can address. Firstly, being readmitted to hospital uh, within 30 days of being discharged is rarely a good indicator. Of course, there might be a legitimate reason. You might have broken your leg and then got appendicitis. But what our threads can tell you is there's not an insignificant number of people who get readmitted through A&E having been discharged very recently. This is particularly problematic for the people that we're talking about. These are older, frailer individuals who might find this more upsetting and confusing. So understanding what the characteristics of such groups is can help us avoid this issue by not discharging people so quickly and making sure that they're definitely ready to go back into a care home. Also, being admitted into a hospital only to die shortly afterwards is not necessarily within the best interest of the patient. Many people would prefer to die in the usual pace of residence, even if that means dying a little bit sooner. If we can understand more about these people that make these trips that end in deaths, um, more of this could be avoided um, and more of these people could stay where they're comfortable. And finally, from our interviews, it's really important that we understand what people on the front line are thinking. We can do as much research as we want with as many numbers and interviews as we like, but if our guidance that we come out with isn't possible to implement, then it's useless. So um, the world is, um, we want to change the world with this data. We don't want to just sit on it. We'll do talks like this, public ones, ones at conferences. We'll produce academic papers. We have proactive engagement with decision makers. So we already have doctors, A&E doctors, GPs on our team, um, helping us to refine the guidance we produce and actually implement it. We work with the innovation arms of the NHS, and we are in the current process of preparing our first report for the Department of Health and Social Care. So we really want to make sure that the, the research we do has an impact, and that's why we are uh, working with all these different groups. So what was hard about this? Not just kind of um, advanced statistical techniques, although uh, Alex did a very good job with those, but we were living through the pandemic too. We were working with people that we had never met uh, face to face. People were off sick, people were overburdened with extra work, people were homeschooling. And in an ironic twist of fate, I was struggling to place my uncle in a care home so he could be discharged from hospital. So it wasn't the easiest time for anyone. And like um, this, this project, like most of my work, uh, is working with routinely collected health data. This data is collected by various, a variety of members of staff when you have a healthcare interaction. And such data is really hard to get hold of um, when you want to do research on it, and actually pretty hard to work with. This is frustrating at times, but it's got to be expected. You wouldn't want to go to your GP and presume that that info would be provided to a random researcher. But on the other hand, I think you'd like to think that we're improving the ways that we deliver healthcare and only access to such data will allow us to work out the best ways to do it. So it's hard, but it's important that it's hard. And on a very simple note, things like the fact the care home phones were busy. We obviously couldn't do face-to-face -face interviews at a time when they were locked down, but we couldn't block lines to care home when they actually needed to get medical help. So tonight, I hope I've given you some insight on how we're using our research to um, understand the impact of a pandemic and help improve outcomes for people in care homes. Thank you. Okay, so um, really great. Thank you both, um, Joe and Jane, and, and thanks to, to virtual thanks, real virtual thanks to Fiona, who's not here this evening. So it's been um, really interesting to hear about your research and some great questions, I think, which has um, really uh, illuminated some other issues that have been of, of interest to both myself and I'm, I'm sure the audience this evening. <laughs>